On Tech News Today, the NSA's big SIM card hack isn't as bad as we thought. Plus, Medium gets more social networking and blogging features. And Reddit joins Google in its quest to cover up naked people. We've got three of the most brilliant journalists in technology joining us today, so stick around. Tech News Today is next. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by CashFly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Wednesday, February 25th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by Gazelle, the fast and simple way to sell your used gadgets. Find out what your used iPhone, iPad, and other Apple products are worth at gazelle.com. And by Blue Apron. Blue Apron will send you all the ingredients to cook fresh, delicious meals with simple step-by-step -step instructions right to your door. See what's on the menu this week and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. That's blueapron.com slash twit. Tech News Today is the show where we talk about the tech news with the journalists who report it. Welcome to the show. My name is Mike Elgin, and joining us as co-anchor today is After Nine's content czar, Joe Panettieri. How you doing, Joe? I'm doing great, Mike. How you been? I've been great. You know, it occurred to me this morning as I was getting ready for the show that you're literally the only czar I know. And uh, it's just and the uh, only living czar also. So that's, that's right. always nice. <laughs> All the other czars are dead that I know. Well, anyway, thank you for jumping on. I know you jumped on at the last minute uh, today, but it's going to be an exciting show because we have amazing news and two really fantastic journalists to interrogate, I mean, interview. So why don't we jump right into the news? We reported to you Friday about the NSA and GCHQ's ability to monitor much of the world's mobile phone activity by hacking a European SIM card maker called Jamalto, which makes about 2 billion SIM cards a year. But now the company is saying that the security threat isn't quite what it seems. Stephen Shanklin is a senior writer for CNET News and joins us now from Paris. Welcome to you, Stephen Shanklin. Thanks very much for having me on the show. Thank you so much for being here. You're always a great guest. Now, did the NSA and GCHQ give themselves the ability to monitor all phone calls taking place through Jamalto SIM cards, or, or did something else actually happen? What happened there? In Jamalto's view, no, they did not. So they had a lot of... Uh, downplaying to do today at Jamalto. The CEO was on stage at a very well attended press conference in Paris. A lot of uh, a lot of curiosity about this particular case. And basically, what Jamalto said was the attacks uh, likely did take place from the National Security Agency in the United States and Government Communications Headquarters in the UK. But there was no way that it could have resulted in a large-scale theft of SIM card encryption keys. So the SIM cards are these little pieces of plastic that fit into your phone. They've got a little chip on there that's used to identify the phone on the network, to authenticate it on the network so you don't have to type in a password. And they're also used in encryption so that your voice communications and your data communications are encrypted. Basically what Jamalto said was it's possible that some keys were stolen, but it would be a limited number. If you did steal them, you couldn't do mass surveillance of lots of cell phones. And if you did, it would only work with old 2G networks. It wouldn't work with 3G networks or 4G networks. So basically, they said, yes, the spy agencies probably did try to hack them, but the severity of any of those attacks was pretty low. Hey, Stephen, did Jamalto drop any hints in terms of other SIM card makers potentially being targeted here? What's the story there? They did not point any fingers, but they did say that uh, there, some, some of the evidence that The Intercept pointed to last week from the Edward Snowden leaked documents said that, you know, there were various carriers involved and various countries involved. And some of those uh, carriers, Jamalto has no relationship with. So it's clear that some of the keys could not have been obtained from Jamalto. For example, there was one in Somalia uh, that had 30, 000, excuse me, 300,000 encryption keys allegedly stolen. Jamalto doesn't sell any uh, SIM cards to Somalia, so it couldn't have been them. So clearly, it's possible that there are other SIM card vendors that could be in the loop, or it could also be that there were other uh, sources of attack. Now, a leaked slide from the UK's GCHQ said that they had, quote, successfully implanted several machines and believe we have their entire network, unquote. They were referring to Jamalto's uh, network. Um, first of all, was that, tr was that true or not? I mean, is that an accurate 
thing that whoever was making this presentation was saying there. And second of all, do you see this as yet another case where the NSA and, and also in this case the GCHQ has it the worst of all possible scenarios? On the one hand, the public is uh, unhappy with them because it thinks that they are listening to every single call through this hack. On the other hand, they're not actually listening to every single call. They, they have the bad reputation without the benefits of having done the thing that the bad reputation suggests that they've done. So uh, you see this across the board with these, uh, these Snowden revelations, and it seems to me like there's tons and tons of bragging, uh, and a lot of this information coming from Snowden is a lot of bragging internally. But in this case particularly, with this particular cl uh, claim from the GCHQ, do you think that that slide was accurate or not accurate? Well... I don't, of course, have any inside information about what the NSA actually did. And the GCHQ, by the way, that slide was from the GCHQ. Uh, Jamalto says that it was bogus. They did not get access to the internal networks. So they said they did detect two very sophisticated attacks in 2010 and 2011, but it detected them and it thwarted them. One of them was an attack uh, on a French uh subsidiary, not excuse me, a French uh, division of Gemalto. And they said they detected that it was sophisticated, but it didn't work. And the other one was a spoofed email allegedly from Gemalto, not actually from Gemalto, but pretending to be from Gemalto to one of Gemalto's customers. And that had a malicious attachment. So if, if somebody had opened that attachment, it would have downloaded some malware and, you know, tried to attack a system. They, they detected that too. Now it's quite possible that there were other attacks that they did not detect. But that's that's the first point. The second point is these attacks were on the relatively public internet uh, accessible network that Jamalto uses. And they say they have their network is partitioned into separate sections. And the section that is involved with uh, SIM card encryption keys is totally separate. So even if you were to hack that network, you wouldn't get access. Um, in response to your second question, yes, yeah, certainly... Uh, the NSA and the GCHQ are getting kind of dragged through the mud here. Um, there's a lot of bad PR for them invading people's privacy and overreaching. But I think, you know, I think it kind of on average it balances out because although there might be some bragging here, there might be some PowerPoint that is not entirely accurate. Heaven knows I've seen a lot of PowerPoint in my career <laughs> and not all of it is 100% true. There's a lot of marketing hype out there, and I'm sure that NSA is not immune to it. But so, so you know, they're they they probably get a worse rap than they ought to get in some cases. But on the other hand, they definitely are being very aggressive. And this particular program shows that, regardless of their success rate with Jamalto and other SIM card makers and other carriers, they certainly tried very hard to use this avenue of attack. And you know the, the the more successful they were, the easier they would an easier time they would have bypassing whatever judicially approved, uh, judicially authorized mechanisms like search warrants. The, the easier time they would have bypassing those mechanisms. So you know I th I think kind of on average it's a, it's a wash for them. Well, it appears that they have done some damage to the United States technology sector. Uh, we learned uh, yesterday that. Uh, the Chinese government has stopped buying from a range of companies because of, they claim, NSA, fear of the NSA spying, and those include Cisco, Apple, and others. And so uh, there is uh, potentially some damage there, uh, it appears. Uh, Stephen Shanklin is at CNET.com, and you can follow him on Twitter at STShank. Thank you so much for joining us today, Stephen. Thank you very much for having me on the show. All right. Well, we want to hear what you think about this story and about NSA hacking and GCHQ hacking. In general, just send us an email to tnt at twit.tv. We want to hear your views on all this. And we got some news for you in just a sec. But first, let's talk about Gazelle. Now, of course, Gazelle has always been a place where you can sell your old gadget so you can get some money for your next gadget, for your new gadget. But now, nowadays, Gazelle will actually sell to you directly. And uh, everything that they sell has a Gazelle certified certification, if you will. Uh, it's always a great deal. They have no contracts or strings attached of any kind. Uh, they have a 30-point quality inspection. So even though uh, the, these devices have been previously owned, they've inspected it to make sure that they are just flawless and they have a 30-day risk-free return policy. It's really a great place to buy something. You know, everybody has a budget. We, we all uh, can't go out uh, and buy the uh, highest price phone in, in, that's out there. We have 
basically say to ourselves, okay, I have this much money to spend. And if you take that money and buy from Gazelle, you're going to get a better device because the prices are lower than brand new devices. And examples of, of what they sell include the iPad mini, the iPhone 5, the iPad 2, the iPhone 4S. You can go back as far as you like, and the further back you go, of course, the lower cost that device will be. And of course, they have uh, two levels of phones and devices that they sell. One of them is certified like new, which means that it's just like a brand new phone. The other one is certified good, which has general signs of wear, but of course, functions perfectly. And, and again, Gazelle is the best place to sell a gadget. Find out what your iPhone's worth, take a minute, and go to gazelle.com to find out. Former Twitter CEO Evan Williams launched the site Medium in 2012, and since then the site has been a place for long-form articles, but I wouldn't have called it a blogging platform, except now maybe I will call it a blogging platform. The company rolled out some changes yesterday that transform what media I Medium is and how it works. Matthew Ingram is a senior writer for GigaOM and joins us now to talk about the changes at Medium. Welcome to you, Matthew Ingram. Thanks for having me, Mike. I apologize for the boarding announcement. Uh, I'm sitting in the airport in Detroit. Yeah, you're on a stopover, and we appreciate you uh, jumping on the uh, show today uh, in, in en route to the West Coast, uh, where I imagine it's warmer than wherever it is you were before you got to Detroit, <laughs> and certainly warmer than Detroit. Now, what new features did Medium announce exactly? Well, the most interesting, I think, is one that seems very Twitter-like. It's, uh, it's basically an instant post feature, so right on the home page at the top. Um, when you're logged in, there's a little box, and it just says right here. And so you can start typing, you can post whatever you type instantly. It shows up in your, on your page. It shows up to anyone who's following you. So it's a Twitter-like feature before you had to create a whole long post you know, and find images, and then it took a long time to publish. It's obviously aimed at the much briefer kind of in-between Twitter and a long blog post. Hey, Matthew, can you tell me a little bit about the business model here? Um, I, I'm just a little confused, Chris. As I understand it, I think some people pay for long-form articles, and now you've got this Twitter approach you're talking about. Are, are they like Blogger? Are they like a magazine? Are they like the Huffington Post, something else? How would you describe it at this point? Yeah, I, w I guess I would describe it as they would like to be all of those things. I mean, uh, Evan Williams said that one of the reasons they launched this feature was they wanted that people thought of them as a place where you just write really long articles. And they didn't want to just be a place where you write really long magazine type articles. He said they want to do uh, all those things. They want to do short, they want to do medium, they want to do long, they want to have magazine style features, but they also want to have you know, briefer thoughts at business model, uh, there isn't one, as to my knowledge. So the business model at the moment is, uh, you know, it's VC funded. Uh, Evan Williams is a billionaire, and so he's trying to build this product and build an audience. Um, I don't think they've really attacked the sort of monetization end yet. Now, you write uh, very brilliantly on journalism in, in general and technology journalism in particular. What is your personal opinion of the new medium as a place for journalists to write? And if it's not uh, ideal for journalists, who is this site uh, perfectly suited for, if anyone? I guess for journalists, you know, I, I, it's great to have a place like Medium if you don't, if you don't run your own blog, for example. Um, it's great to have a place where you can reach new readers. It's great to have a place that, that makes writing so easy. Their writing tool is fantastically simple. Um, the risk, of course, is that if Medium owns, Medium is a platform, just like Facebook or Twitter, and so you're effectively hosting your stuff on their platform. You don't. You own content, obviously, but you're sort of giving up something to that platform as opposed to running your own site. I think for anyone who wants to write and doesn't have a place to write, it's a great competitor for things like Huffington Post. It's really easy to write. Um, there's a potential to reach a new audience. Uh, it's quite a great site, actually. I'm a big fan. Now, uh, I'll ask you one more quick question, and we'll get you off to your flight. Uh, to what extent does Medium do algorithmic sorting? I was actually surprised to learn that uh, in your article that they do some algorithmic sorting. Can you describe what's, where they do it and how they do it? 
So the other feature they or another feature they launched in addition to the Twitter style short post is they're using tagging instead of what they used to use, which was channels. So there would be a channel called tech, there'd be a channel called entertainment, and you could either add your post to that channel or an editor would add a post to a channel. Now they're relying on tags. So whatever you tag your post, if someone searches that tag, your post will show up. But it's also, my understanding is it's also those tags are going to filter um, based on which posts are getting shared a lot. So if you check the tech tag, then you'll see posts that have been getting shared a lot. Matthew Ingram is at gigaohm.com. You should and can follow him on Twitter as well at Matthew, I'm sorry, Matthew I. That's I for Ingram. And of course, Matthew has one T. Thank you so much for joining us, Matthew Ingram. All right. We, we are, again, Skype is uh, out to get us again. Uh, just because we're paranoid doesn't mean Skype is not to get us. Uh, if you have... Uh, uh, an experience with Medium you'd like to share as either a reader or a blogger or a journalist or in any capacity, let us know what your experience has been at TNT at twit.tv uh, or you can call our number, which we'll give at the end of the show. We told you yesterday that Google was cracking down on naked people on Blogger, the company's blogging platform. Starting on March 23rd, any blog on the site with sexually explicit or graphic nude images will be auto-converted to private status, which means blog administrators will need to grant permission to each and every visitor. Plus, Google won't accept new blogs after March 23rd that contain nudity. Well, after our show ended yesterday, Reddit announced that they too are cracking down on the clothing challenged. Their new policy says that any pictures showing sexual acts or nudity can be posted only with the explicit consent of the people in the pictures. The move comes in the wake of multiple scandals involving pictures of underage models and also the posting of stolen private pictures of dozens of celebrities Joe Panettiere, we talked about this a little bit yesterday when we were talking about the Google story, and uh, we brought up the idea that, you know, Tumblr, which is owned by Yahoo, of course, is now uh, one of the last bastions yeah. for pornography in a blogging uh, context. Of course, t uh, uh, Reddit is not a blog, uh, so that, that's, that's not in the same category as blogger. But still, uh, as the, you know, we see that, we saw this with, with effective troll controls when, uh, when sites continue to implement better con troll controls, all the trolls went to the remaining sites. So right. now it seems likely that a lot of uh, people who are posting pornography are going to go to Tumblr, and then that may or may not create a problem for Yahoo. Do you have any sense about Yahoo's corporate I, culture, about Marissa M M Meyer, and what they're going to do about this? Well, I was shocked when they bought Tumblr in the first place because the problem was already there. It's not like Tumblr is some sort of new destination for all these these migrants, let's call them. I mean, it, I, I don't know what percentage of traffic comes from, quote unquote, adult content or porn over on Tumblr, but it's got to be huge. And you got to wonder what type of due diligence uh, Yahoo did as, as part of that deal to buy Tumblr. Um, what exactly did they acquire other than this... this uh, training ground for the next generation of porn, so to speak. And I know there's other good content on Tumblr, don't get me wrong, but there just seems to be no gateway at all. It's the wild, wild west over there. So I think I think Yahoo's going to have to answer for this longer term. Um, and I shouldn't even say longer term. It's going to be near term. And Twitter as well. Twitter is another site where they don't even try to uh, to ban anything. And again, you know, whether uh, sites, you know, I, th I think the important thing is that there are sites for every type of content. Some people want a site want to go to right. a website where they're they're not going to stumble across objectionable material or materials objectionable to them uh, other people do and so you know we want to make sure that there's plenty of choice out there but i just think it's in an interesting dynamic especially uh, you know i think that i think that reddit is a little bit more just like reddit is growing up they're not banning it they're just making sure that it's legal and also that it that it that it involves consent by the people who who are in the pictures that sounds fair enough google on the other hand is actually banning it from March 23rd onwards. And so, um, yeah, so it's an interesting change. It, it may affect, uh, who knows, thousands of people, millions of people. I don't know how many. A blogger is a huge, huge network, and Reddit, of course, is very, very popular and has dozens of millions of users. We've got some follow-ups for you. We reported several times on the big hack of health insurance giant Anthem. At the time, we told you that some 80 million customers may have been victimized in the attack by having their personal non-medical data stolen. Now Anthem has announced that somewhere between 8.8 .8 million and 18.8 .8 million people who are not Anthem customers may also have been victimized. 
The reason is that Anthem is part of a network of independently run Blue Cross Blue Shield plans, millions of which are operated by other companies, but Anthem still has those records in its breached database. So if you are a Blue Cross Blue Shield customer, look out. Your data may be out there, so you need to check on that with your insurance company and find out what the heck happened. We've got some product updates for you as well today. Microsoft said yesterday that it's removing support for Facebook Chat and Google Chat from the consumer version of Outlook. Joe Panateri, the Google Chat uh, uh, elimination makes a ton of sense because Google doesn't even support that anymore. And Facebook Chat does is, is more mysterious because, of course, uh, Facebook and Microsoft are fairly close I have been traditionally. I think they're likely to grow apart as they increasingly compete yeah. against each other in the future. But still, what what do you think they removed uh, Facebook chat here for? You know, I don't know. I think I think we're talking about a friend frenemy situation here. Excuse me. Um, Co-opetition. Yes. Yeah, co opetition And and you know, let's talk about where Facebook's heading right now. Facebook is developing that that business oriented piece of their social platform, and Microsoft already owns uh, what is it Yammer, and so you know they, these two are on a collision course when it comes to social enterprise communications. So Microsoft, on the one hand. We have spoken in recent shows talking about how more and more cross-platform they're becoming and more and more open they're becoming. But I think there's going to be instances here where they where they uh, knock off some support here and there uh, for their frenemies where they feel like the competition's getting a little bit too fierce. Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, in mergers and acquisitions news, Google has acquired a company called Toro, which helps developers promote their apps on Facebook. The company used to be called Red Hot Labs. The Google acquisition means that while Toro will continue to optimize campaigns and provide reports for existing customers, it won't accept new customers who want to promote on Facebook. Instead, Toro staff will join Google's mobile ads team. Joe Panateri, this looks to me like an aqua hire, I think, uh, and also um, the added benefit of it kind of uh, screws Facebook a little bit. So, um, you know, it's all <laughs> yeah, good for if, Google. If, if, we, if we can grab talent and hurt a competitor... <laughs> All the better. That's, That's right. definitely the mood. Exactly. All right. Well, courtroom drama. Apple was ordered to pay $532.9 million after a federal jury in Texas found that iTunes infringed three patents owned by the patent troll company SmartFlash. Apple plans to appeal and said in a statement that, quote, SmartFlash makes no products, has no employees, creates no jobs, has no U.S. presence, and, and is exploiting our patent system to seek royalties for technology Apple invented. Unquote. The trial took place in Tyler, Texas, which has in the past decade seen juries side with patent trolls on a regular basis. SmartFlash is theoretically based in Tyler, in fact, where the company is registered, but they appear to have no offices. We've got some big numbers for you today. 60. That's the percentage of the world's population that has never connected to the Internet. The number comes from a new study by Facebook's Internet.org. Uh, organization called the State of Global Connectivity. And the other big number related to this is 90. 90% 90 is the percentage of the world's population that is actually within range of internet connectivity in terms of cell towers and, and so on. So 90% could get access if they could afford it or whatever the reason is they're not getting an access, but only 40% only, uh, actually gain access to the internet. That's a pretty stunning set of numbers. Yeah, Mike, can I weigh in there? You know what's interesting there is is Facebook and Google and others are working so hard to get that other 10% who you can't reach, right? So they're they're floating all these uh, balloons. They're putting satellites in orbit to get that other 10%. Why don't they go after all the people who are within range but haven't turned on the on switch yet? That's what I don't understand. What are they going to do there to really drive up adoption? To a certain extent, they do do a few things. Uh, both Google and Facebook have plans where they will subsidize data access. And again, in, in the, the kind of areas where people can't afford to get online, the, mm -hmm. those those types of uh, countries have cell plans that charge for every single uh, byte of data that, that's downloaded. They do it on a, you know, per day, you know, they don't say, oh, you have unlimited or anything like that. It's not like that at all. It's actually very expensive for those people in those areas. And so they have subsidized. So as long as you're using Facebook, you know, Internet.org itself and also Facebook both have programs that uh, subsidize access to Facebook and a few other things. Google has something like that as well. And a few other companies do as well. But it's really not enough. And I agree with you. That's really the place to do it. It's probably far cheaper to just subsidize 
access by people who are already within range of a network than it is to have a network of balloons circling the earth to bring a network access to a remote place that doesn't even have the ability to connect. So it is a, a bit of a curiosity. And, uh, you know, it, 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 the upside, though, is that, you know, and it's one of the most interesting and fascinating parts of this story, is that it's getting to the point where Facebook and Google and companies like these uh, two companies have saturated the available uh, right. people the user who are there. Base. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and it, they're, yeah. they're now to the point where their incentive is not only to connect people to the internet, but to increase those people's incomes. And of course, internet access can do that by providing people with, with uh, banking services, with uh, the ability to reach other customers and so on. And so that's where I think the next phase of this type of activity is going to lie, which is actually reaching out with programs that help people uh, who otherwise couldn't uh, afford internet access to afford it by increasing their wealth to some extent. And that's a good thing, obviously. Well, another big number for you, three million. That's how many dollars the U.S. State Department is offering as a reward to anyone who provides information leading to the arrest and conviction of Russian hacker Evgeny Bo uh, Bogachev. The reward is the highest bounty U.S. authorities have ever offered for a computer-related criminal. He's accused of running the computer attack network Game Over Zeus, which allegedly stole more than $100 million from online bank accounts as well as other crimes. Yeah, I didn't know they still had wanted posters. Uh, yeah. Dead or alive. Yeah, offline wanted posters for the for the most wanted cyber criminal ever. So yeah, um, I don't know if anyone in the post office is going to turn this guy <laughs> in. But <laughs> exactly, it looks like Uncle Fester. Yeah. Uh, so you heard it here first, uh, folks. Uncle Fester's wanted for cyber crime. Ninety six point three. That's the percentage of the global smartphone market now owned by Android and iOS, up slightly from last year, according to IDC. Android now owns 78.7% of the global smartphone market. iOS has 15.1%. Windows Phone has 3.3%. BlackBerry has 1.9%. And the rest of the industry splits 0.2%. The dominance of iOS and Android, especially Android, is really getting uh, incredible. I mean, part of, yeah. part, of the, part of it is how much of the pie they have. And the other part of it is how much bigger the pie itself is growing. Right. And the other piece of it, Mike, is is where are the profits in that pie? And, and it sounds like the smartphone industry is starting to look a whole lot like the PC industry. And what I mean by that is all the Windows players have most of the pie, but Apple's got most of the profits with Mac. And I, I think Android and iOS are increasingly like that. Yeah, that, and that's, of course, the sweet spot of the market. They, their dominance in the profit area has really skyrocketed. It's hard to say at this point whether... Uh, that is the result of a really stellar fourth quarter where Apple is uh, going gangbusters in China, et cetera. Meanwhile, Samsung, the other profit leader, was having a kind of a bad fourth quarter. We don't know how much, in other words, we don't know how much of this is temporary, but at least in the fourth quarter of 2014, Apple just killed it in terms of profits. I mean, they, their dominance was absolutely uh, unparalleled. And of course, the valuation yes. as a company is now uh, more than twice that of ExxonMobil. All right, another gigantic number for you, 1,000. That's how many Google Chrome experience, experiments have been created to date. Google itself created the 1,000th Chrome experiment to highlight the milestone. Launched in 2009, Chrome experiments exist, according to Google, to showcase the work of creative coders who want to push the limits of HTML5 and JavaScript. Google also announced that they've redesigned the ChromeExperiments.com website. And Google's new Chrome experiment is an interactive interface to the other 999 experiments. Let's have a look at that and go ahead and crank up the sound there, Jason. This is really cool. And each one of those little floating bubbles, we're looking at the number 1,000 that's made out of these. It's a little bit like an acid trip, really. There's like floating bubbles that are like flying around. And if you click on any of those, and you can go ahead and click on one randomly, uh, Jason, it'll take you to the experiment that it represents. And some of these are really, really cool experiments. Other ones are, you know, less cool. But mostly, these are uh, developers who are uh, trying things that you don't normally see on websites. That is really cool. Now, right now, what we're looking at on the video version of this show is that Jason has grabbed some kind of bizarre squid alien creature and is dragging it around mercilessly across the screen. Very weird. 
But yeah, you uh, know what I love about this, Mike, is it it really is in a uh, Google's making an inclusive approach here. And what I mean by that is I have a niece who's actually uh, still in high school and she just got accepted into a summer college program. It'll be two weeks, but it's, it's this type of thing. Google is actually involved in the program. Um, there's all sorts of coding that she'll be doing. And if you look at the classroom and who's been accepted into this, it's kids from all walks of life. So it's great to see Google working in this area and attracting so many different people to the conversation. It certainly is. And uh, again, that website that they designed is really, really cool. Uh, I love it when Google does stuff like that. They're really good at that kind of thing. Well, in news, you can lose whiskey bottles of the latest product to get the NFC treatment. The booze company Diageo, uh, Diageo, I think is how you pronounce it, and the Norwegian printing electronics firm ThinFilm will showcase at Mobile World Congress next week a prototype connected bottle for Johnny Walker Blue Label Whiskey with NFC, NFC tags built into the label. Thin Film claims that its smart labels are nearly impossible to copy or modify. We'll see about that. The tags offer different benefits depending on the situation. For the store, for example, running a store-specific app, NFC tags can offer stock control and anti-counterfeiting protection. Consumers can use the very same tags to get promotional discounts in the store, but once the bottle is purchased and brought home, the tags can offer cocktail recipes and other content. Very cool stuff. And finally, Samsung mocked the culture of fan designs for future phones by creating a few of its own. A new website from Samsung's Norwegian team trotted out these wild concepts for the Galaxy S6, none of which are anything like the actual Galaxy S6, and they know it. Let's take a look at some of these concepts. There's a clear, invisible, semi-invisible phone, the Wonder Woman phone or something. There's a curved phone that's just way too curved. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you go in the other direction, we'll see the rest of those. There's probably about five or six of these things, uh, uh, pretty cool phones, uh, and uh, some of them. One, that one is really ridiculous. It's, it remind you know, it's uh, it's like the office, you know, with the triangular tablet. In this case, it's a kind of triangular shaped phone. There, here's one that's on a pillow of some kind. Very weird. And here's one that has wings. Looks like a. Yeah, the, the speakers fold out, and so it looks like a ladybug with speaker wings. Oh, wow. Yeah, very cool, uh, sort of. Well, we've got some feed. Yeah, we got some feedback for you. We got an email from uh, Neil, Neil Fildes. I hope I'm saying his name right. And he wrote the following to us. He said, I don't know how Yahoo, et cetera, should handle this request for access to encrypted uh, communication, but I do believe that the NSA cannot be trusted to interpret the law for themselves. He's they're referring specifically to the story we covered yesterday where a representative from Yahoo uh, essentially grilled the NSA director about uh, their desire to, uh, to, to have backdoors into Yahoo uh, communica encrypting communications. Uh, clearly, they've shown that they're not trustworthy, and you can tell that they are lying because their lips are moving. Wow, some uh, searing cynicism there from uh uh, TNT fan Neil Field Days. Very, very cool stuff. We're going to wrap up the show in just a sec, but first I want to tell you about our other sponsor, Blue Apron. Blue Apron is a fantastic service that will send to your door amazing ready to cook meals. These aren't, they don't cook them for you, they don't spoil that for you. They make it easy for you to cook them yourself. So the food is super, super fresh, better than restaurant quality. I've judged this for myself. I've made a whole bunch of these and I'm a weekly subscriber. Really fantastic. It make me feel like a really great uh, cook. And the most important part for me is that I got a house full of really, really particular eaters with who have really, really good taste in food. And they're very difficult to please uh, when it comes to, to, to food. But every single Blue Apron meal, and of course, every meal is a different meal. They never send you the same meal twice, has been a total crowd pleaser at my house. Really great stuff. Um, Exotic foods, very American foods, it, you name it, it's all over the map. Really cool Asian foods. And a lot of the times when you make foods that are uh, that uh, originate in other countries, from Thailand, from Mexico, uh, from China, from uh, various parts around the world, they're going to require ingredients that you're not going to have in your house. Uh, many of us don't even live in an area where you can find stores that sell these ingredients. But Blue Apron will sell, will send you exactly the amount of, in, of those ingredients uh, exotic ingredients that you need to make their recipes. And it's super, super easy to do. They give you this card, one for each recipe. The box that I get for the subscription has three meals in it. Uh, each meal serves two people, although it really, it serves three people. I mean, there, there's, there's extra. We always have leftovers, which is kind of nice. And you just follow the step-by-step -step instructions and you end up with this fantastic meal. You know, when I first heard about Blue Apron, I thought, you know, it's like, 
it, it's it, it, it's they make you do the cooking, you know, so it, it doesn't say, but then when I tried it, I realized this is like the best of all possible worlds. You get to 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 make the recipes, but you don't have to go through the difficult process of following a regular recipe. It's super, super easy. You don't have to do the shopping. You don't have to even think that much, which after a long day, I think is really great. I don't want to have to think too much about uh, about making dinner. So if you want to try it, and I really, really recommend that you try it, we're going to uh, let you try two free meals. Uh, Blue Apron is a better way to cook, and you can check out this week's menu and get your first two meals free by going to blueapron.com slash twit. Two meals free just for going to blueapron.com. Don't forget the slash twit part at the end. And we thank Blue Apron for their support of Tech News Today. And when you get those two free meals, shoot me an email. And let me know uh, what you think of it. Love to hear how you like Blue Apron. I know you're going to love it. So check it out. Well, that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is the Tech News Today. Our TNT fan of the day is Craig Jerdingen in St. Paul, Minnesota, who posted this picture on Google Plus of himself listening to Tech News Today while commuting to work in a bitter, freezing cold on a fat tire bike. A fat tire bike is a bike with big fat tires. This, uh, that looks cold. That looks really, really cool. I was freaking out yesterday because when I got up in the morning, it was 34 degrees outside. Joe, you're, <laughs> you're going to scoff at that. And of course, this guy's going to scoff at both of us because he rides his bike in Minnesota. Yeah, St. Paul. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Those, his bike is cool. I looked at his Google Plus uh, profile. And he's got a bunch of pictures of him riding through forests, through snow, whatever, on this uh, bike. i got to check one of those out. I've never ridden one. How do you watch or listen to TNT? Just record a video or take a picture of yourself or your setup and post it on Google Plus, Twitter, or Facebook, or Instagram, or anywhere. We'll find it as long as you use the hashtag HowIWatchTNT. And uh, Joe Panateri, uh, I want to thank you for jumping on the show and co-anchoring today. Great job as always. Can you uh, tell us what's going on with your, uh, with your company? Absolutely. Over on After Nines, if you, if our listeners or viewers go check out www.afternines.com slash CEO, you're going to find our latest podcast and that features 17 Hats CEO Donovan Janice. And he describes how solopreneurs, that single person companies can really automate everything from sales to marketing to invoicing and, and, and et cetera. You know, it's really about empowering that single person company to really automate everything. And that is what uh, Donovan is describing. Plus, he also talks a little bit about the 1.25 million he just raised in seed funding. So that's what's cooking this week. And then longer term, we actually... Um, we broke ground actually on uh, some software development work, um, but it's going to be several months before we pull back the curtain on that. Yeah, it always takes longer than you wanted to, but uh, such yes. is the uh, nature of building brilliant software and websites and all that stuff. Well, thank you so much, Joe Panateri. Uh, you, you'll see Joe on this show next week. Again, Joe, thanks for, for joining us as co anchor today. Always good to see you, Mike. Take care. All right. You can subscribe and you should subscribe to Tech News Today on iTunes, or you can choose another way to subscribe at twit.tv slash TNT. You can watch us live every weekday at 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC at live.twit.tv, or on the app or browser plugin of your choice. If you're ever near the Brick House in Petaluma, California, come on in and watch us live. We love to see you here. And you can follow us on Twitter at Tech News Today TV. You can also follow me personally on Vine. Just go to vine.co slash Mike dot elgin and let us know what you think in general or specifically about the stuff we covered send us an email to tnt at twit.tv or call 260 tnt show and don't miss our tech news tonight at 4 p.m pacific tonight and every weeknight right here on the twit network my name is mike elgin thanks for tuning in we'll see you tomorrow